masters and others. It seems to me you've probably had enough teaching. But the tendency is to always want to hear more, to compare, and to end up in doubt as a result. Then each successive teacher increases your confusion further. There's a story of a wanderer in the Buddha's time that was in this kind of situation. He went to one teacher after the next, hearing their different explanations and learning their methods. He was trying to learn meditation, but was only increasing his perplexity. His travels finally brought him to the teacher Gotama, and he described his predicament to the Buddha. Doing as you have been doing will not bring an end to doubt and confusion, the Buddha told him. At this time, let go of the past. Whatever you may or may not have done, whether it was right or wrong, let go of that now. The future has not yet come. Don't speculate, or speculate over it at all, wondering how things may turn out. Let go of all such disturbing ideas. It is merely thinking. Letting go of past and future, look at the present. Then you'll know the Dhamma. You may know the words spoken by various teachers, but you still do not know your own mind. The present moment is empty. Look only at arising and ceasing of formations. See that they are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and empty of self. See that they really are thus. Then you will not be concerned with the past or the future. You will clearly understand that the past is gone and the future has not yet arrived. Contemplating in the present, you'll realize that the present is the result of the past. The results of past actions are seen in the present. The future has not yet come. Whatever does occur in the future will arise and pass away in the future. There's no point in worrying over it now, as it has not yet occurred. So contemplate in the present. The present is the cause of the future. If you want a good future, create good in the present, increasing your awareness of what you do in the present. The future is the result of that. The past is the cause and the future is the result of the present. Knowing the present, one knows the past and the future. Then one lets go of the past and the future, knowing they are gathered in the present moment. Understanding this, that wanderer made up his mind to practice as the Buddha advised, putting things down. Seeing ever more clearly, he realized many kinds of knowledge, seeing the natural order of things with his own wisdom. His doubts ended. He put down the past and the future, and everything appeared in the present. This was the one Dhamma. Then it was no longer necessary for him to carry his begging bowl up mountains and into forests in search of understanding. If he did go somewhere, he went in a natural way, not out of desire for something. If he stayed put, he was staying in a natural way not out of desire. Practicing in that way, he became free of doubt. There was nothing to add to his practice, nothing to remove. He dwelt in peace, without anxiety over past or future. This was the way the Buddha taught. But it's not just a story about something that happened long ago. If we at this time practice correctly, we can also gain realization. 
We can know the past and the future because they are gathered at this one point, the present moment. If we look to the past, we won't know. If we look to the future, we won't know because that is not where the truth is. It exists here, in the present. As we sit here, attending to the breath, cultivating awareness, I'll give a few more um, images that Ajahn Chah used for helping meditation. Make sure you practice every day, every day. When you feel lazy, keep doing it. When you feel diligent, keep doing it. Practice the Dhamma, whether it's day or night. When the mind is at peace, keep doing it. When it isn't at peace, keep doing it. It's like when you were a child learning how to write. At first the letters didn't look pretty. Their bodies were too long, their legs were too long. You wrote like a child. With time, though, the letters looked better because you practiced. The way to focus your mind on an object, to catch hold of the object, is to acquaint yourself with your mind and to acquaint yourself with your objects. It's like the way men catch a lizard. The lizard lies inside the hollow of a termite's nest with six holes. The men close off five of the holes leaving just one hole for the lizard to come out. Then they sit there watching that one hole. When the lizard, lizard comes out, they can catch it. You focus on the mind in just the same way. Close off your eyes, close off your ears, close off your nose, close off your tongue, close off your body and leave just the mind open. In, otherwise, in other words, exercise restraint over your senses and focus just on the mind. Meditation is like men catching a lizard. You focus, you focus your mind on the breath, being mindful and careful to be aware. Whatever you're doing, 
be alert to what you're doing. The feeling that arises in the mind at that moment is that you're alert to what you're doing. That feeling is what makes you aware. Make your mind aware and awake. Keep looking after it. If anyone comes to visit, wave them away. There's no place for them to sit, for there's only one seat. Try to sit here receiving visitors all day long. This is what's meant by Buddha, the meditation object. Stay firmly right here. Keep this awareness going so that it can look after the mind. As you sit right here, all the visitors that have been coming to visit since way back when, when you were born little and tiny, will come right here where you boot toe all by yourself. As for the guests, the visitors that come wandering by, fabricating all kinds of different things, you let them go along in line with their own issues. Whatever it is, wherever it's going, who cares? Just acquaint yourself with the visitors who want to come and stay. You have only one seat to receive them, so you put one person there all the time. The others will have no place to sit. Now when they come here and talk to you, they don't get to, get to sit down anywhere. The next time they come, whenever they come, they keep finding the person sitting here who never goes away. How many more times will they keep on coming if all they get to do is talk to you? You'll get to know them all, all those who've been coming since way back when you were first aware of things. They'll all come to visit.
before I continue with any more readings, are there any uh, questions? Yeah, just maybe speak up so okay. that. Um, ah, there we go. The passage that you read about Ajahn Chah going to a remote, deserted monastery to practice alone, and then mm -hmm. him having a realization about goodness mm -hmm. in others and himself. Could you say something more about how was it? Was it just a matter of diverting his attention into his own practice away from other people or was there something that he could uh, further we could understand from that about how we can ourselves um, change our attitude toward what we consider to be difficult people in our life right yeah so the uh, the question is around uh, that sense of uh, you know how to say something about how Ajahn Chah would, uh, uh, you know, can we just direct attention to ourselves and establish that goodness within ourselves, or or how do we deal with people externally as well? So Ajahn Chah would uh, would uh, make a point of of uh, uh, really uh, encouraging us to, uh, one of course is that having that sense of, uh, as, as uh, he mentioned in the teaching from Ajahn Man, in the sense of being a witness for oneself, in the sense of having that internal knowledge and certainty and freedom from doubt within oneself of what is what's good, what's right, what's um, beneficial. Um, but also uh, carrying that into uh, the uh, relationships that we have with, with other people. And, uh, uh, and that was uh, uh, living in a monastery, especially in a monastery with many people, um, Contrary to popular belief, uh, not everybody is, uh, I mean, not, e not even, let alone enlightenment, they're not even more peaceful. <laughs> uh, and some can be downright irritating. Uh, so that uh, it's just the, uh, the nature of human, human relations, uh, whether one's in the world or whether one's in a monastery, and uh, being able to have a have an say, yeah, an internal anchor um, that knows and okay this is this is how to establish peacefulness within myself. This is how to establish clarity or establish the internal goodness that that uh, uplifts and brightens the mind. Um, <coughs> Remember Ajahn Chah telling a, a story of the, uh, um, and he was a great storyteller, and he would uh, telling a story of the uh, this uh, uh, good-hearted person uh, in the village. Uh, quite, uh, he had some means, and uh, he decided he wanted to uh, do something really meritorious so that he uh, started to build a, um, uh, a, a small meeting hall, which is uh, in village Thailand. Uh, whenever somebody would be traveling or there'd be some meeting in the, uh, in the community, you would use this communal hall. Um, or people would have relatives visiting or whatever, your house wasn't big enough, you'd have this communal hall that you could uh, uh, take people to. Uh, so anyway, he uh, got people together, got uh, the, the wood and the materials together, and he built this uh, meeting hall. And, uh, and then he, uh, 
Uh, it wasn't shortly after it, uh, it was finished and he died. And because he'd put so much energy, attention, effort, attachment into uh, this little meeting hall, he ended up being reborn as a hungry ghost in the, in the, in the hall. And, uh, and then he, uh, uh, so, and he was concerned about his hall, and, and, <laughs> and then a group of, of uh, uh, villagers from several villages away came traveling, traveling along, and they came and stayed in his, his hall. And so he was, they, uh, uh, they settled in for the night, and uh, he was, uh, he was kind of happy that they were they were there using his hall and and uh, uh, but then um, they uh, they decided to go to sleep as they would and uh, and this uh, hungry ghost who had uh, put all this effort into making this really nice hall uh, was upset at the they were just messy yeah. and they're laying there and. This weren't neat and tidy, so he started looking at it. Oh, if we could just get them lined up nice and neat and tidy, then that would be good. So he gets them all sort of pulls on one and pulls on the other and gets them all sort of neatly lined up along their heads. <laughs> and I said, wow, okay, now that's now that, that looks good. And he starts to, goes off to his resting place in the hall and then he, because he sees their feet. Oh my God, they're all messy. They're not, how'd this happen? So then of course he pulls them all down and gets them all in. Then the heads are all off. <laughs> so he spends, <laughs> I mean, you get the gist. It's, you're never going to get all these people all lined up and neat and tidy and in the same place. So that, uh, that's the, uh, um, and in terms of living with other human beings, you just have to recognize that you never get them all. You're never going to get them all the same, all neatly lined up exactly the way you want it to be. It's it's going to be. We have to have a an internal, an internal guide, an internal uh, witness that is able to l let it be what it is, but then also not get swept up in the. The views and opinions, the, the proliferations and the and the, uh, the various intensities of of, of other people. <laughs> so this and that is your own practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to you got to have a an anchor in your own practice. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We good. Yep. There it is. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, did you as a Westerner ever have any um, difficulties in meeting Ajahn Chah in um, either with Buddhism or um, with Thailand? And how did that get resolved or did it get resolved? <laughs> That's uh, last night was Saturday night at the monastery. And because uh, we give a talk every Saturday night. And because I've been steeping myself in sort of Ajahn Chah and reviewing. So last night's Dhamma talk was was about Ajahn Chah, and uh, as we're riding in the truck up the hill, there was uh, Ajahn Karuna Dhamma said, "Oh, you got to tell that story at Spirit Rock tomorrow." So that, there's an opening. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, there was a, a time when uh, uh, I was uh, I'd probably been about. Four rains retreats at that time, so still quite a young monk. Uh, he had lots of opinions, lots of views, um, and uh, then there was a, um, a one morning a a, a city monk and a, a lay person showed up at the monastery and. The uh, uh, the monk um, I had met him before, and 
Yeah, I had my views and opinions about him. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like him particularly. <laughs> and uh, so then he, he brought this um, Swedish uh, journalist um, to the monastery, and he was working for some spiritual journal, and he was going around Asia asking various spiritual teachers um, just actually just three questions. And, uh, and then uh, so he's talking to me and saying, this, this, this is what he wants to ask Ajahn Chah. Um, you know, and he wants to ask Ajahn Chah, you know, why do you practice? How do you practice? What results do you get from the practice? And, you know, those are actually quite good questions. Um, and it, it's, it actually gives an opening. To, you know. But, of course, my own views and opinions were such that I you was know, uh, grumbling and complaining inside myself about this particular person. And then after the meal, we went uh, went over to meet Ajahn Chah and uh, sitting down and talking to him. So uh, I had to act as translator, um, and uh, I was the the one who was around at that point that had uh, enough language to to, to translate. So um, they came and met with Ajahn Chah, explained, and so that I translated, and, and uh, um, but of course there's a, this internal dialogue going that I, and Ajahn, so I translated the questions for, for Ajahn Chah, and then he uh, um, he just sort of started talking about something else. <laughs> And uh, um, then he uh, um, um, after a while he you know goes back and forth back and forth, and then he turns to me and, and said, "Did they ask some questions?" <laughs> and I goes, I said, yeah, yeah. And I said, what were those questions again?" <laughs> so I go, "Okay, why do they practice?" How do you practice? Um, what results do you get from the practice? Say, oh, okay. And then he starts talking about something else. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this goes on another couple, three times. And uh, and then uh, and I feel he's really putting the screws on me. <laughs> and then he. Uh, then it comes again. I said, what, "What were those? They'd ask some questions. So, Has somebody got some paper and some pencil? I don't. Oh, I don't I, you should write those. Write those questions down." And so this so novice goes off, gets a paper and a pencil, and come back. And, I say, and he gets, "Okay, okay. What was that first question?" <laughs> so, okay, why do you practice? Yeah, okay, what was that second question? And I'm sitting there translating. And, okay. Okay. So what was the, what was the, okay, what results do you get from the practice? So, okay. and then he looks up and looks at, at the fish. Why do you eat? <laughs> and then the person is, because this whole sort of scenario has been going on, he's sort of taken aback. He says, and he's not quite sure. We say, no, why do you eat? And, and he's not quite sure. And then the monk sort of steps in. No, he wants an answer. <laughs> He doesn't want a question. He wants an answer. He said, Why do you eat? He said, he said really, this is, the, this is the essence of spiritual practice. I mean, we, we eat because we've, we've got the suffering of hunger. And in the same way, we practice because of the suffering of existence. And we're looking for a way out. We're looking for a way to, to, to solve that, 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 kind of, that suffering of our hunger, of, of truth, the hunger for peace, the hunger for knowledge. And that's that's what's that's why we practice. And said, when we really understand, that's what we're doing. We really see that clearly. 
So that's when we'll start to figure out how we practice. We'll look for ways to practice. We'll find ways to practice. And when, and, said, and what happens when you, when you eat n- food that's nourishing? When you're full, you feel complete. You feel, you don't, you don't have that suffering of hunger anymore. And that's the result you get from practice. The suffering is finished. And so it's just that, that very, very direct and simple uh, direction to uh, that, which could have been very speculative. Um, and so that's a very, that's quite a a flavor of Ajahn Chah's teaching, and then also sometimes putting the screws on his disciples and, and uh, uh, highlighting their, their foibles and their stupidity. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm, I'm curious. As an abbot taking care of your community, how do you handle it when a kerfluffle comes up? <laughs> um, well, it depends. <laughs> um, you know, you really, um, um, yeah, you really have to uh, um, rely on patience. Is really the first one. Patience. Um, and also you live in community, so you have to you know, pay attention to what, uh, how others see things and how they're uh, responding and uh, you know, getting some um, feedback or perspectives. Because sometimes uh, St. Abbot uh, doesn't see everything. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then really... Uh, uh, looking to ways of of uh, trying to uh, f- find resolution through yeah what is it that actually draws out wholesome qualities rather than than just um, say reacting or responding uh, really quickly to try to put out the flames or to you know to get rid of the problem um, because it's important to to really see it for more clearly for what it is, and uh, and not to respond too quickly, um, because oftentimes that that initial re- reaction or response is out of the discomfort with the kafluffle, uh, and we have to be willing to um, be present with it, which is actually the same way we have to deal with our personal practice um, because yeah there are usually our initial uh, response that's what when the when the Buddha outlines the four noble truths uh, suffering cause of suffering cessation of suffering path leading to cessation of suffering he also outlines the appropriate response to each of the noble truths and the first noble truth of suffering is to be known. And the second noble truth of the cause of suffering is to be relinquished. And we tend to want to relinquish that suffering really quick. <laughs> and without knowing it clearly first. Uh, and then, then when we don't understand the causes clearly, then we can't relinquish it fully. <laughs> What are the antidotes for the next two? That are they what you were saying? Uh, the, uh, Thank you. the cessation of suffering is to be realized, and the path leading to cessation of suffering is to be cultivated. Uh, those are the responses to those noble truths. Yeah. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, if you, um, when I pay attention, then I'm more aware. When I, when I am mindful, then I become more aware of suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, I could just go into story and not know that I'm suffering. Mm-hmm. So um, why, why would we choose 
to be to become aware of the suffering? Well, I think it's to to notice the difference between actually knowing with awareness and knowing with proliferation, because the uh, uh, once we move into story mode, then there's no end to it. Whereas when it's something's known really clearly, it tends to fall apart. It tends to 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 dissipate. It tends to dissolve. And there's the flavor to that 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 is is uh, very compelling. <laughs> Whereas that. That, that going into story mode and getting entangled in, in all of the complications that the mind can spin out, um, it's got a very different flavor. And um, yeah, the flavor of the end of suffering, yeah, I like that. <laughs> Maybe I can do a bit more reading. I don't... I've got a whole ton of stuff that I could be reading. And... Uh, Come back. <laughs> um, I thought maybe one thing that's written here. Ajahn Chah set up his monastery, Wat Bapong, in the hot season of 1954, and it was near his um, uh, home village. Uh, his mother and a brother and various villagers uh, came to a place where he was practicing with the beginnings of a of a following um, in another and in. Um, in a, um, actually, it's now it's in a different province. How old was he? Let's see. He was born, I think, was it 1918? If I remember correctly. He was born in 1918, so 54, 36. Yeah, he'd be 36. Yeah. So he would have been a monk for 16 years. Uh, and... Um, his practice uh, at that time was was very uh, um, 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 he said uh, he's talked about it at times where he said in those at that period before he went back he was practicing his practice was going so smoothly that it just you know sometimes like our arms round he just wouldn't feel that he was touching the ground. It was just so buoyant and light and bright. And one of the things that uh, a few years before, his, his teacher, Lumpu Kinnerli, which you mentioned, had told him uh, that your practice is going good, don't start teaching yet. Uh, and, and he'd followed that advice and uh, uh, his teacher had said, yeah, it might be okay to start doing a bit of teaching now. Um, so then his, um, but it's just a, a bit of a, a, a background um, you know, perspective that. Uh, The Ajahn Chah that left such an indelible impression on all those who met him during his trips to the West in the mid-70s is, is for many the Ajahn Chah, that one. <laughs> that was taken 1975, IMS, Jack was there. Um, um, Most of the recorded talks that have survived were given during that period of his life. Most of the well-known photographs, the price, priceless seconds of footage in the BBC documentaries. It is a wise, chuckling grandfather figure with a pot belly and a walking stick 
that English and American Buddhists remember. There was something so genuine and unaffected about the warmth and wisdom that emanated from him during that period, something so timeless, that it was hard to imagine how he could ever have been any other way. But of course, he had changed. Looking back to the 1950s, a somewhat different Ajahn Chah emerges, and if it is an impressive and admirable figure that emerges, then it is also perhaps a less engaging one. Here is Ajahn Chah, the spiritual warrior, rather than Lumpa Chah, the beneficent king. To those who lived with him in the early days of Watpapong, Lumpa was a spare, stern, vigorous figure. The few photos of him, of him from this period convey a sense of an almost frightening intensity, a honed and disciplined mind, unremittingly focused on its goal. If in his old age he was compared with the tiger at ease in his cave, at this time he might be likened to the tiger stalking his prey. It was a period in which he felt the culmination of his practice to lie within his grasp, seeing the kind of momentum and intensity of effort needed to break through the wall of ignorance. He was in no mood for compromise. He pushed his disciples to their limits. Those who en who could endure it, those who could endure it, stayed. Those who could not left. He would tell them, "Nibbana lies on the shores of death." It's a, uh, that's a, it's a, uh, it's good to sort of see that that, you know, this comes out of something. Uh, you're not born like that. <laughs> uh, the uh, As, a, as an example of a period during that time, um, Ajahn Chah would often say, patient endurance is the general of practice. You have to be really tough, he said, because this is not a light matter, it's heavy. One legendary episode that figures prominently in the history of the Watpapong Sangha is the building of the famous, or notorious, road up to Tamsang Pet. It's a branch monastery in which Ajahn Chah really loved the place. It was about a thousand acres of, of forest at, north of, of Ubon. Uh, Ajahn Anik, who some people might have met, uh, he came here last year um, with, with uh, he's one of Ajahn Chah's uh, earlier disciples. Ajahn Anik's account gives a good idea of the challenges. We went to survey the route for building a road up the hill at Tamsang Pet. The head of the Ubon Highways Department said, If you're really going to go ahead with this, I'll send you a couple of engineers. Well, the engineers lasted two or three days. They couldn't handle the mamui, which is like poison oak. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> they said, This size project, you need a large budget. You need explosives, tractors. You can't do it by manpower alone. Lumpa hardly said a word. But after they left, we did our own survey, and then we got down to work. Mm -hmm. There was very little time to rest. We would start working at 3 in the afternoon and finish at 3 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then after a couple of hours rest, it was time to walk down the hill on Amsram. It's about 5 kilometers down the hill to the nearest village. Um, after the daily meal, most of us would take a short rest, but Lumpa would sit receiving guests until 3 when he would start working with the rest of us. He would hardly even get up from his seat. Even though we were all younger than Lumpa, nobody could keep up with him. We used sledgehammers to break up the large rock, smaller hammers into the, on the fragments, and carried the rocks on our backs in bamboo baskets. Lumpa couldn't do the heaviest work. He was one of the rakers. The villagers brought gunpowder to get rid of some of the larger boulders. People from the highways department came to look, and seeing that we weren't going to give up, occasionally brought up some explosive. It was really tough. It was putting your life on the line. I suffered an internal hemorrhage and bruising in my chest. My chest felt tight. I couldn't breathe properly. I think that was the beginning of my heart complaint. <laughs> the villagers who volunteered to help gradually drifted away until only the monks and novices remained. Everything had to be done well, well and quickly. 
If anyone started to joke or play around, he wouldn't say anything, but he'd immediately walk away. The following day, there would be a Dhamma talk on how to act like a monk, <laughs> like a Dhamma practitioner. Whatever Lung Pao did, he did it with absolute sincerity, and no matter how tired he was, never once did I hear him complain. Hmm. There's also uh, a story of the, uh, uh, also from Tham Sang Pet, uh, but this is from 1981. In 1981, Ajahn Chah spent the three-month uh, rains retreat period some 100 kilometers to the north of Wat Lapong, that is, Hilltop Branch Monastery, Wat Tham Sang Pet. Ajahn Chah was now suffering from a number of debilitating illnesses, and it was hoped that the more salubrious climate there would help him get some strength back. A small sangha would greatly reduce his teaching responsibilities. The remoteness of the monastery would reduce the number of lay visitors, which had now reached flood proportions at Wat Bapong. In fact, Ajahn Chah didn't get very much rest at all. Tham Sang Pet was by no, by no means as inaccessible as it used to be. Most of the people unable to pay their respects to him at Wat Nong Bapong were more than willing to travel another hour or two to find him. By this time in his life, Ajahn Chah was too public a figure to find solitude so easily. Wherever he might be, people wanted to see and hear him. At Tham Sang Pet that year, it was the same. Som Jai Chayalat, a, a laywoman who went to pay re her respects to Ajahn Chah, recounts her impressions. Every morning, Lung Po would walk very slowly across the rocky area between the sala, uh, the meeting hall, and the kitchen receiving alms. As soon as he appeared, a crowd of people converged to him to put food in his bowl. Those who hadn't brought any food with them, or were too late to prepare it in time for alms round, squatted on the ground, their hands in Anjali, all of them expressing regret at not having the chance to put food in his bowl, ruining their luck. But it was all right, they would get the chance to offer their food in the sala at the mealtime. After the meal, everyone waited for Lung Pao to come out and talk with the visitors in the meeting hall. There was a huge number of people and a steady stream throughout the day. In the evening, it was a bit better. Most of the people who'd come during the day had gone back. I listened to Lung Pao give teachings from early evening. He didn't sit on the Dhamma seat, which is usually like a higher seat like this, actually, uh, but at his usual place on the raised monk's platform. He taught in a relaxed, informal kind of way, interspersed with periods of chat with various of his guests. I remember at one point in his discourse, <clears throat> Lung Pao was talking about making mindfulness continuous, and to show us what he meant, he lifted his kettle and poured out the water at first in drops, and then in a steady stream. It was one of the similes that he was most fond of using in his talks. When it was time for Lung Pao to rest, his attendant monk invited him to return to his kuti, his, his cabin, or sleeping cabin. We all just held our breath, afraid that he would leave us. It seemed like he had only just started talking. Lung Pao smiled at the monk, but didn't get up, and after a few moments continued his talk for a while longer. The attendant repeated his re request to Lung Pao to rest, and we all groaned aloud. It was a plea and a protest. Lung Pao smiled and said to the attendant monk, I'll give them just a bit more. And he continued until finally it must have really been time because when the monk invited him again, in quite a firm voice, he picked up Lung Pao's walking stick and stood there with his torch in his hand to show that he was ready to take him back to his, to his cabin. The attendant turned to all we lay people and said, said, to, said to us, It's already far past the time. Lung Pao smiled at us once more in a comforting way like a father. He said, They won't give me any more time. I suppose I'll have to go. It was as if every single person in the whole meeting hall sighed with dismay. The time had flown by. It seemed that we had only been listening for a few minutes. I'd heard a Dhamma talk from Lung Pao's own mouth for the first time, and I was utterly satisfied, but I still wanted to hear some more. <laughs> But, uh, so he had that ability to draw people in, um, and uh, 
he had that uh, ability to uh, 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 and just respond out of compassion. It always, uh, it was always, it was always the compassion that that generated, uh, even when it was was uh, yeah, it was obviously wasn't good for him, um, and uh, um, that uh, uh, that was a hallmark of his his temperament and how he both responded to the practice, I mean, he'd give himself to the practice, and how he responded to people, he'd just give himself to people. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll read a few things from sort of the, the Western his interactions with the Western Sangha. Um, um, in 1967, a Wat Bhikkhu called Tansamai returned from a Tudong trip to the north of, of the northeast with an old friend who literally stood head and shoulders above him. Even the most restrained bhikkhus at Wat Bapong were unable to resist at least a sur- surreptitious glance. The new bhikkhu was six foot three inches tall, had blonde hair, angular nose, and bright blue eyes. His name was Sumedo. The two men had run into each other for the first time in Korea, more than ten years before, dressed in the creased white uniforms of their nation's navies, and now a second time, by coincidence, dressed in the yellow robe of the bhikkhu, they had met in the meditation monastery on the banks of the Mekong River, just across from Laos, uh, from Vientiane, where Ajahn Sumedho had recently been ordained. They exchanged their stories. Ajahn Sumedho told Somai how he had returned to college after the Korean War and gained a master's degree in Asian studies from Berkeley. After graduation, he had joined the Peace Corps and taught English in Borneo before moving on to a spell at Tamasat University in Bangkok. That it was after receiving meditation instruction in the near, at the nearby uh, Wat Mahathat, uh, which is no, next to the university, that his interest in Buddhism, born in Korea, had ripened into the decision to become a bhikkhu. Now, though after some months of solitary meditation in a small hut, Ajahn Sumedho was beginning to feel some frustration about the form of his monastic life and was feeling the need for a more rounded way of practice. Tan Sommai's descriptions of Wat Bapong were opportune and inspired him. His preceptor, Ajahn Sumedho's preceptor, kindly gave permission for him to leave and the two two monks set off to walk down to, to Ubon, Pat Sumedho feeling as if, it was, as if I was being pulled by a magnet. The attractive force held. Eventually, Ajahn Sumedho would stay for ten years, form the nucleus around which the Western community of, of monks would coalesce, establish Wat Nanachat, the International Forest Monastery, before moving to England to begin at Chithurst in southern England the first of nine overseas branch monasteries. Someone once asked asked Lumpur whether he had any special connection with Westerners that led to so many becoming his disciples. He replied that his acquaintance was restricted to cowboy movies he had watched before he ordained. (laughs) It was deja vu. When I was a small child, I went to see a cowboy movie with my friends, and one of the characters was this big man smoking cigarettes. He was so tall. Uh, it fascinated me. What kind of human being could have such a huge body? <laughs> <laughs> the image is stuck in my mind until now, and so a lot of Westerners have come. If you're talking about causes, there was that. <laughs> when Sumedho arrived, he was just like the cowboy in the movie. What a long nose. <laughs> as soon as I saw him, I thought to myself, this bhikkhu is a Westerner. <laughs> and I told him that I'd seen him before in a movie. 
<laughs> so there were supported, supporting causes and conditions. That's why I've come to have a lot of Western kith and kin. They come even though I can't speak English. I've tried to train them to know the Dhamma as I see it. It doesn't matter that they don't know Thai customs. I don't make anything of it. That's the way things are. I just keep helping them out. That's the gist of it. <laughs> when Ajahn Sumedho asked to be accepted as a student, Lumpa agreed, but made one condition, that he fitted in with the Thai bhikkhus and didn't expect any special considerations. At other monasteries in Thailand where I, this is Ajahn Sumedho speaking, at other monasteries in Thailand where I'd lived, the fact that I'd been a Westerner had meant that I could expect to have the best of everything. I could also get out of the work and other mundane things that the other bhikkhus were expected to do. I'm busy meditating now. I don't have time to sweep the floor. Let someone else sweep it. I'm a serious meditator. But when I arrived at Wat Bapong and people said, he's an American, he can't eat the kind of food we eat. Lumpa said, you'll have to learn. And when I didn't like the meditation hut I was given and asked for another that I liked better, Lumpa said, no. The whole way of training was that you had to conform to the schedule. When I asked Lumpa if I could be excused from the long Dhamma talks, which I didn't understand, he just laughed and said, you have to do what everyone else does. <laughs> um, not, all of, not all of the foreign bhikkhus at Wat Bapong were from Western countries. Ajahn Koesako, for instance, was from northern Japan. After a period mountaineering in Nepal, he had devoted himself to learning yoga in India before visa difficulties forced him to leave for Thailand. Ajahn Kavesako, too, was immediately drawn in. And this is him speaking. I arrived at the monastery just as the bhikkhus were leaving on alms round. I was very impressed to see them walking in a line, composed and restrained. I was transfixed. It was such a beautiful sight. It was something I'd never seen before. I walked into the monastery and found myself on a neat and clean path that was pleasant to walk along. There were no branches or leaves littering the path. It impressed me even more. I thought the abbot must be very good. He must have a very strict discipline. Ajahn Koesiko's lay name had been Mitsuo Shibahashi, and Ajahn Cha, as he often did in such cases, made a Thai word out of alien sounds, in this case transforming a Japanese surname into the nickname Sibat Hasit, which means 4 baht 50, which is the, the <laughs> currency. <laughs> yeah, four, yeah four, four bucks and 50 cents. <laughs> Ajahn Koesiko remembers vividly how Ajahn Cha taught him about the futility of the external search for experience. Now, we're so foolish, we're so foolish, we usually spend our lives chasing, chasing our shadows. If we were to spend as much time searching for our minds as we did for other things, then we'd already be a long way along the spiritual path. We're lost. Our minds are cruel, and we don't realize it. Our mind suffers, but we're unaware of it. We do nothing but add to the bad things already in our hearts. Wat Bapong is a place for eliminating those bad things. Here we devote ourselves to constantly searching for the mind and watching it. Sitting meditation, walking meditation, chanting, these are the basic practices. Everyone has to do these things. Four baht fifty, don't worry. You still got your eyes, arms and legs and hands and all your faculties. I guarantee that you can practice, that it will have benefit. Words of advice are just empty breath. You read something and that's the end of it. These things can't compare with practice. Start right now. You will find goodness and truth. And it's right there that you will discover the teachings of the Buddha. During the long illness at the end of Ajahn Chah's life, uh, Ajahn Koesiko, uh, uh, while he was nursing him, expressed the gratitude he felt towards him. 
Uh, Ajahn Koesakal. I felt as if he gave me new life. He was like mother and father to me. He gave me so many things. It was like I was slowly sinking into quicksand, just about to be swallowed, and he pulled me out and saved my life. My debt to him is so large that nursing him like this won't repay even a small part of it. There's more, but uh, we can maybe just take this period of time to let the day settle and uh, sit quietly for not quite ten minutes.
we can close the day with a uh, uh, chant of the uh, dedication of blessings. It's a, uh, um, a common um, way of uh, uh, yeah, recognizing the the goodness that has been done, and then to share the blessings with well, with all beings, you know, and uh, spreading out, and, and that uh, um, so that uh, for those who know the chant can please chant along. For those who don't, um, just establish that sense of dedicating the goodness of this day for for all beings. Now let us chant the verses of sharing and aspiration. Okay. Good day. <laughs>